Bible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. We invite you to our website at ebiblefellowship.org for additional Bible studies. And now with his study in the book of Romans, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible study in the book of Romans. Tonight is study number 33 of Romans chapter 1 and we're beginning in verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And I'll stop reading there. Now, um, we were looking at verse 17 at the end of our last study. And just to quickly summarize, it starts off, For therein is the righteousness of God, referring back to the gospel, which is the word of God, the Bible. Therein, the Bible, is the righteousness of God who is Christ, and his atoning work and God's salvation program. The righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. And we were looking at that passage where the woman who had an issue of blood for many years thought, if I can only but touch him, I'll be healed. And so she got close to the Lord and did touch him and you know, that, that was a, a no-no. That was something that people who were in unclean condition were not to do in Israel. Because if you touched anyone, you would make them unclean. And of course, that's the picture. That her uncleanness was transferred to the Lord Jesus. And then Jesus says he perceived that virtue had gone out of him. Who touched him? And, and that is uh, um, just furthering the picture that God is drawing that the sin or the uncleanness of the woman went to Christ and his virtue, his um, his holiness went to the woman, cleansing her. And she, she was healed of that plague and did um, at that point become clean. She, it was only the issue of blood making her unclean. And and so uh, it was a beautiful picture of what Christ does in salvation. Virtue went out of him and into the woman. And thereby she became virtuous. Likewise, faith, who is Christ, and, and he, he showed his faith at the foundation of the world with his action, with his work. That's what James 2 says. Um, tells us that faith without works is dead. And and someone can say they have faith, but if they have not works, then it's a lifeless, it's a dead faith. And it, and it has no blessing whatsoever. But faith with works, that's another story. And a statement is made there, I will show thee my faith by my works. And it's not our work, you know, um, People who have a natural tendency to want to do work read that and they think, well, it's something we have to do or after we become a Christian, we have to show forth good works. No, it has nothing to do with that. It's really a statement made by the Lord Jesus Christ. I will show thee my faith by my works. And he did so at the foundation of the world. He entered into the world in time to go to the cross to do that very thing, to show the work that he had performed, that Hebrews 4 verse 3 
says was finished at the foundation of the world. And, 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 and so from his faith to faith, the, his faith goes out of him and becomes part of the gift of God, the magnificent uh, gift of his salvation to sinners, and we receive faith. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. From faith to faith, and and then after we have the Spirit of God, we begin to develop the fruit of the Spirit, uh, one of which is faith. Okay, and, and uh, then at the end of the verse it said, As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And I'll just turn here. I think I mentioned it, but we'll read it in Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And that's confirmation. We're understanding this correctly. The, the righteousness of God is revealed from Christ to the sinner, from faith to faith. He, he will impart grace and faith and, and all the whole package of spiritual attributes that accompany God's salvation. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll go on to verse 18 where it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. Now, the word against is more often translated upon or on. It's that kind of idea. But since it is wrath of God revealed from heaven upon all ungodliness, it it does carry the sense of being against it. Uh, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So the ungodliness and unrighteousness is the object of the wrath of God, which is revealed from heaven against them. And the Greek word translated as ungodly, the root of it means worship or to be devout worship or devout and the greek uh, negative prefix is attached to the word uh, negating it and and so literally it means no worship or not devout the men are not worshiping men they're men who do not worship and of course that would mean god and they're not worshiping God in spirit and in truth. They cannot worship God in spirit because their spirits are dead in trespasses and sins. They have no life in their soul. And so that's not surprising. And neither can they worship God in truth. And the last part of the verse addresses that. Who hold the truth in unrighteousness. And We'll look at the word hold a little bit closer when when we move through the verse. It has the idea of suppressing, holding back. But let's just look at a couple of verses that speak of ungodliness. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 5 says, And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And that just means they they wanted nothing to do with God and his word. They, they were people just like today. They wanted to live their lives alone or apart from God in peace. Of course, that's a contradiction in terms. But since God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is peace, people, people just want to be left alone. Just leave me alone. I, let me do what I want. I just want to plant my crops and and have a family and watch them grow and, you know, have some of the good things of life, enjoy some of the pleasures of this life. And what's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong is that you're speaking as though you're a free agent, as though you're your own person, 
that you belong to you. But that's not true. That's not the case of any human being. We're created in the image of God. God created us. He's the creator. We are the creature. He created us to worship and serve him. To serve righteousness. To obey him. And, you know, it's not an awful thing to worship and obey and serve as a servant to God because God is good. God is righteous and just and holy and worthy to be praised, worthy to receive worship, worthy to be served. He deserves these things. And it's the nature of man. We are created to serve God, but in our rebellion, we said, no, we won't serve God. And who who did Adam and Eve end up obeying or serving instead of God? The serpent, Satan. When they obeyed the lie, they, of course, brought the wrath of God down upon them, the curse upon them and upon the creation. And they established servitude Not to God, but to sin and to Satan. They became servants of unrighteousness, servants of sin. And and the word here, which is translated as unrighteousness, is Strong's number 93. And it's also translated as iniquity in Luke 13, 27. Unjust in Luke 18, verse 6, as wrong. In 2 Corinthians 12, 13. So we we can get the idea of what this word is pointing to. But uh, probably the best verse to go to is in 1 John 5, verse 17. 1 John chapter 5, verse 17 says, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. That basically sums it up. All unrighteousness is sin. And here God is saying the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, those that will not worship God, and unrighteousness of men. The sin of man. And we know the wages of sin is death. Whosoever, as a matter of fact, the Bible says, whosoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in one point, is guilty of all. And this is unrighteousness. Sin is unrighteousness. It is a wrong thing, an unjust thing. It is iniquity that brings the wrath of God down from above. And and yet, uh, when we think of these words, ungodliness and unrighteousness, basically... That is a description of everywhere we look in the world. You you can look in any direction. You can look at the world's institutions and, and what do you see? Ungodliness and unrighteousness. You can look at the world's entertainment industry. What do you see? Unrighteousness, ungodliness. You can look at the educational systems, the the schools, the colleges. We see the same thing. Everywhere we look in science, they come to ungodly, unrighteous conclusions that are not even scientific. Therefore, they're also lying about them, which is deceitful, trying to make people believe that theories are facts and proven science when it's not true. So there is ungodliness and unrighteousness in the scientific world, and and every place we look, of course there is, because it's in man. Jesus knew what was in man, and and basically it is ungodliness and unrighteousness. It is sin that dwells in the sinner, and it brings down the wrath of God upon them for these things. Well, let's take a look at the wrath of God 
Let's look at a few verses that speaks about this wrath. First of all, we read in Matthew 3, in verse 7, where it says, But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Which is interesting, because we know this is in the first century A.D., and the statement is made that there's a wrath to come. And we also know from John chapter 3, in the last verse, verse 36, it says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And that's revealing because it's telling us that the sinner who does not become saved has God's wrath abiding upon them. And yet it says here in Matthew 3, 7, there's wrath to come. And this is why it's necessary to point this out, that because of sin, right from the very beginning of the world, God brought judgment. In the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. And they ate and they died in their soul. God struck them dead in their soul existence. And and so from that point forward, the soul of man has been a dead thing. And and, uh, it was necessary in salvation, which only, of course, a few were uh, recipients of God's grace in this way. They became born again or their soul was restored to life. There was a resurrection of the soul, and that is God's salvation. But the rest, the majority of mankind, have lived their lives with a dead soul. And with the wrath of God abiding on them for their sin. And this means that they would die, and when they die, they would they would go to nothing. In that very day, their thoughts would perish. That's God's wrath that has brought death to them in the physical part of their being on the day they died, although there remain the body to deal with. And and so God worked out judgment upon sinners all throughout the history of the world in each generation, yet he also determined there would be an official judgment day that would come at the end of the world. And at that time, he would bring judgment, pour out his wrath from heaven, and judge all mankind in an official way, finally concluding that judgment with the destruction of the cursed creation and the cursed people, all the sinners who never became saved, and then they'll be gone forever, even the bodies, even the dust and ashes of what's ever left from people who have died over the many thousands of years of of the history of the world, the dust and ashes will be burned up. They'll be gone forever. That's the official judgment. That's the wrath to come, as well as there could be an aspect of that at any point in the history of the world to the individual sinner who was always living their life with the threat of death, with the threat of dying unsaved and with God's wrath abiding upon them and and then they would not receive eternal life and, and again their conscience existence would cease and so forth. So that's one thing we have to notice that there there is a distinction between the official day of wrath and the normative wrath that was abiding upon all sinners. Remember God even says of the elect in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature 
the children of wrath, even as others. So God's elect before salvation could be classified as children of wrath. Why? Because the wrath of God was upon us. It was upon us because our sins had not been forgiven in the sense that the atoning blood of Christ, the payment he made at the foundation of the world, was not yet applied to us through God's word. Just uh, an example, this would be the thief on the cross, a child of wrath, even as others. And he lived his life that way all the way up until he went to the cross. He was an ungodly, unrighteous man. Then Christ saved him. And Christ being the word and, and the shed blood that Jesus had given at the foundation of the world was applied at the last few hours of his life. And then he was delivered, translated out of darkness, out of the kingdom of Satan, from under the wrath of God into the kingdom of God's dear son. And of course, he entered into heaven. Christ said, today thou wilt be with me in paradise. And, and so he did. His, when he died physically, his soul did not go to nothing. It did not cease to exist. His thoughts did not perish in the sense that he, he had a living spirit. And that spirit went up into heaven to be seated in Christ Jesus and, and to remain until the last day. So, uh, again, we, we need to recognize this distinction. Now, the official day of wrath can be seen in many places in the Bible. If we go to Revelation chapter 6, you know, I read a few verses in Revelation. Revelation 6, in verse 16 and 17, it says, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him, that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And also in Revelation 11, uh, this is when the seventh trumpet sounds, and then we read in verse 18, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come. And that, that was the warning that John the Baptist was saying, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Well, well, now Revelation 11 is saying it's, it's here, it's come. Thy wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets. And, and we know from this language that we're living presently during the time of the dead, that they should be judged. It's judgment day. And it's also a time where God gives reward to his servants, the prophets, to the saints. And uh, that, that will come at the conclusion of this whole thing for the elect children of God. In Revelation 19, it says in verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So we, we're familiar with these verses by now, and we could read several more, but it, it is the day of wrath, judgment day, which we're learning quite a bit about in this time because of what God says in Romans chapter 2, verse 5, where we read, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure us up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And the last part of that verse is uh, giving us a lot of information because it's saying, it's the day of wrath. So it's the official judgment day. The day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Now this word 
Revelation, it's in Strong's Concordance in the Greek, number 602. And it's related to the word we have in Romans 1 verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. And here the word revealed is Strong's number 601. And it means, just as we would think it means, it, it is revelation. And, and revelation in the Bible involves God revealing truth. God revealing information. And, and when he does so, that is revelation. For example... In Matthew 11, and these words will be either the same word, 601, or the related word, 602. In Matthew 11, beginning in verse 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. And of course, Jesus is referring to truth about himself. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. See, no man knoweth the Son uh, but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father. It's very similar to that scripture says, Of that day and hour knoweth no man. Same words. But here God very carefully says, uh, No one knows, save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. And God could have said the very same thing with those verses dealing with no man knows a day or hour, unless I reveal it to them. And it, as he says in Acts 1, verse 7, it's not of you to know the times and the seasons which the Father has set in his own power. Also, in Matthew 16, in verses 16 and 17, it says there, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. You see, what was revealed to Peter? A doctrinal truth, a fact that Jesus was the Christ. He was the Son of the living God. And that's what this word revealed identifies with, revealing biblical truth. Well, we'll have to look more into this, Lord willing, in our next Bible study. You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. Visit our website at ebiblefellowship.org for additional studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.